Well, you have to take people where they are when you meet them. You know, you can't, you can't start to judge them or criticize them for not being as idealistic or as the way you want them to be. Because we all start out the same. We, we were all born into families. And if you win the birth lottery and you're born into a loving family, well, chances are you have a better chance of making it and having a meaningful life. If you lose the birth lottery, the odds are against you. I taught, I taught in the prison for four years, and most of those had lost the birth lottery. And they had made, and they'd made some choices which didn't turn out too well. But yet, uh, I, I was unable to relate to them. I, I'd bring in my little books, peace books on Gandhi, and I thought, oh, they're going to learn Gandhi, and I'm going to tell them about all about Mahatma Gandhi's great peace vision. It didn't go too well for the first six weeks. They didn't care about Gandhi. I said, how can I, how can I relate to them? So finally, I, I asked them one day, I said, does anybody here know how to steal a car? <laughs> Every hand went up. And one guy said, Wait, you don't, you don't, you don't have to steal a car? Suddenly realized how ignorant I was. And he was a smart guy. They're all smart people. Uh, 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 that's Miss French, right? Yeah. That you don't have to steal a car. Yeah. You, but, but you know Shakespeare, you know Shakespeare's sonnets, I'm sure. Yeah. You, you, you know Hamlet and, you know, Otello. So everybody's smart about something else. They were highly... They know how to steal a car, when to do it, where to do it, how to do it quickly, what day of the week, what time of the day was best. They were geniuses. <laughs> so that's so then we talked about how to how to burglarize houses and all these other <laughs> But they're all intelligent people. Just intelligence that society did not reward that particularly well. So from there, then we started to ease back a little bit and then do a little reading and, um, and, and, and started to read prison literature, of which there's a large amount. Malcolm X I turned his life around when he was in prison. And so you've got to take people where they are. I bicycle mostly to get around, and I, I, I bicycle to my high school classes. I met a father the other day. And he's walking in the metro, I'm going this way, he's going that way, so we meet occasionally. I had his daughter in class a few years ago, and I asked him, how's your daughter, his daughter doing? She goes to William and Mary, she's a senior now. I said, how's she doing in college? Oh, she's making wonderful grades and doing well. But, he said, I am really worried about her. I said, what's your worry? She has no passion for anything. She's not on fire yet. And he was very concerned about that. And that goes to the point of your question. How do you, how do you, how do you get people to be combustible? And that is the great mystery of teaching. How to set people on fire so they'll, when they leave us, they'll burn on their own. I've seen it happen over and over again. I never worry about that. Um, I had a student a few years ago at American University. We had a large class that year, about 200 people. And this one girl would, would always walk into class late. I learned she was from a fairly wealthy family. And she'd walk into class and go sit in the back row. And those of you who are professors, you know the question we always have in our minds when we're, when we're babbling away to our classes. We always ask ourselves, hmm, I wonder if they're getting it. And we thought, oh, yes, but they, I'm dispensing the truth and wisdom, and they're soaking it up. They are definitely getting it. Well, this, while this student would always walk in the back row, she had one of those glazed out, foggy looks about her. Heads always bobbing up and down like that. She was glazed eyes. She was obviously an English major. And they always have those fogged out looks about them. <laughs> And I'd look at her and I'd say, my God, she's now within six hemispheres of getting it. She used to write little poems in class, little haiku, you know, Japanese haiku, 17 syllables, three lines, and she'd write them out and pass them around to everybody. And it, you know, it got to be mildly disrupting, but I said, well, at least a few of her brain cells are halfway active. 
Well, she graduated. I didn't hear from her for about 10 years. And one day, a letter comes. Turned out to be a very poignant and touching letter. She joined the Peace Corps. And I said to myself, wow, this is the first person I'd ever thought. That's the last one in that class I'd ever thought would have joined the Peace Corps. But she did. They sent her to Morocco, a little small country in, in northwest Africa, right at the, at the top of the Sahara. She taught for three years in the village school. She stayed an extra year. And I learned from the country director when she left, the children in the little town wept uncontrollably. They loved her so much. She was the first one to come in from an outside, outside area. And she bonded with those kids. It was no big deal, but she was there. She took him on a field trip one day, walking through the town square, just a little small rural village. And just by chance, a pickup truck drove into town bringing in some hay for the camels. It was a rainy day. So they walk along, and there comes the truck, parks right in front of them, and the teacher looks over the side, see what's in there. And there was the hay, and there were newspapers in the bottom absorbing all the muck. It was a rainy. But one paper was still dry. She opens it up, and it was the International Paris House Review, the only worldwide newspaper. It was still dry. It was about three months old, but the news was still fresh. If you haven't heard it, opens it up, and there, by bizarre long shot chance, was the column of mine on the op ed page. Oh my God, there's my professor, right in the newspaper. And it was the paper was done absorbing all the muck. And that's where a lot of columnists end up, too, in the back of all pickup trucks. Very absorbing we are of it, absorbing all the all the dirt and foulness. She writes a letter to me. She says, Professor, you may not remember me. I wasn't one of your more attentive students that year. I was a second semester senior. I was bored and numb. I couldn't wait to get out of college. I, en I ended up joining the Peace Corps, and they sent me over here. I, I remember your class because I was not, as I said, one of your more attentive. I was, I was distracted. But I brought the books with me for that class. I saved them. I brought them with me. And I've been reading them over here, self-educating myself. I never forgot. And then she said, I do now believe that, that the books made sense. Nonviolence does make sense. The moral of the story is so obvious. And every flower will bloom when it's ready. And some flowers bloom early and some bloom late. And we teachers have no right or need to know whether or not you're getting it. If we teach with passion, teach with fire, you'll get it in your own good time. It's not our time, it's your time to decide. So that's why I never, I never despair when you see somebody in class who's just kind of sleeping away and is just halfway groggy. It's okay, it's okay. Um, so I don't know whether that gets even close to your question, but, uh, but uh, yeah. Uh, they, yeah. No? Uh, uh, does anybody been in the Peace Corps? Where would you serve? Senegal. Senegal. No kidding. Uh, wow. Up country? Both places, north and south. Did you really? Yeah. Wow. Well. They, a lot of people are from Senegal. You know who they work here in town? At Whole Foods. What years were you in the Peace Corps? 98 to 2001. 80? 98 to 2001. 98. Was that your choice? Did you choose to go there? Or? Mm, I wanted to go to East Africa, but they don't let you select that. Yeah, place. yeah. That's a very wonderful culture. Uh, uh, my daughter in law is from there. It's from Senegal. And, uh, uh, let me just read what Sergeant Schreiber, I'm sure you know who Sergeant Schreiber is, do you not? The first director of the Peace Corps. And he gave me my first job in Washington, and oh, I've loved all these years. He's been my closest friend outside of my family. And um, in this book here, he has a wonderful line about about his solution. Uh, so page 56, 
There it is. Uh, uh, the ah yes, and the phrase uh, uh, he explained how we wanted Peace Corps volunteers. We sure we wanted curing people, but only if they were caring people also. In the phrase, uh, the cure is care. Caring for others is the practice of peace. Caring becomes as crucial as curing. Caring produces the cure, not the reverse. Caring about nuclear war and its victims is the beginning of a cure for our obsession with war. Peace does not come, peace does not come through strength. Quite the opposite. Strength comes through peace. So that's the name. I got the title for the book from that. So I admire you. Oh, was I uh, tell us about that? Was that a life-changing experience for you? Yes. Yeah. It made yeah. me want to come back and work on the empire. Yes. That's why I'm here. You're right. That frequently happens. <laughs> you, uh, you go abroad, and they tell you go go fix that messed-up country you're from. Uh, the Senegal is not invading any other nations. They don't have nuclear weapons. Uh, they live very simply. They, uh, they live realistically. I think this country is collectively insane. <laughs> Carl Jung, I, I know that sounds a little flip, but Carl Jung, the great Swiss psychiatrist, he, uh, the great Swiss psychiatrist, he said nations can be collectively ill the way individuals can be collective. Uh, can be singularly ill. And, and what's, how do you define illness? When you cut off from reality. We are cut off from, uh, from the world's reality. It might be geographical, because you've got a big ocean on one side of us, a big ocean on the other side, but yet we are not aware of, 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 of the results of our political decisions. Otherwise, you wouldn't have 40,000 people a day dying of hunger Ignoring that is, I think, a form of insanity. So pick out what issue you want to work on. Uh, I was a student here at the University of Maryland, 1986. Said she was pre-med. Uh, her name was Sarah Linda. And she went to, I think she went to Whitman High and then came here. And Sarah was going to be a doctor. And, and, and I, I admired that greatly. I asked her one day, I said, aren't you worried about, about all the malpractice insurance you're going to be forced to take out as a doctor? And she said, well, where I plan to go, uh, she planned to be a third world med, uh, go be a doctor in the third world. She said, where I plan to go, they don't worry about malpractice. Uh, so, and she did, she went to medical school and doing just fine. Um, and and so I, I, I would urge all the undergraduates here to think about joining the Peace Corps, get out of the country for a couple of years. I think that's been happening. Uh, 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 I'm sure the professor know. It's almost automatic that you spend a semester or two overseas now. I think some schools require it even. At American U, we have, we have a deal with the University of, of Havana in Cuba. We send students to North Vietnam to study, and, and, and not to mention Dakar and, and, and India, or Buenos Aires. I always tell people, don't go study in London for a semester. London is just a suburb of Scarsdale. <laughs> go to Senegal, go to El Salvador, and also right here at the university. 